Welcome to my talk, Under the Hood of Reactive Data Access. My name is Mark Paluch, and we are going to talk today what really happens beneath the application layer, what happens um, when you access um, reactive data sources, what's the difference to imperative and synchronous data access. So that's not an introductory talk, and it won't really explain uh, what uh, Spring Data can do for you API-wise but it will help you to understand um, what challenges you will see, face when you switch from the traditional model to the reactive model one. So with Spring Data, we have support for several modules, and only a few of them uh, provide, provide us uh, with reactive data access. This is MongoDB, Redis, Cassandra, and Couchbase. And as you have maybe have learned, um, JPA isn't part of that. Yet, um, the reality is that the majority of our um, data is still stored within relational databases. So one might then ask, what about JDBC and JPA, which are the most common technologies to access data within relational databases? So. We have learned today in the keynote that there are possibilities to access uh, relational uh, data uh, in a reactive fashion. But let's step, take a step back and take a look on a re uh, relational databases from a, from a um, farther perspective. So we will then see uh, that relational databases aren't really an ideal fit for a, rela a reactive world. Why is this? Well, with reactive systems, we try to, we are improving scalability. We turn systems from an imperative model into an event-driven one. And by, by doing so, we are getting rid of logs. We are getting rid of the pattern threat per connection or threat per request. With data, uh, relational databases, we get, uh, by, by natural means, a limited scalability model. You, typically, you run a relational database as a single node machine, and if you're lucky, you, ha you uh, have a cluster. But in most cases, it's one, Mars, uh, one um, primary data node, and, uh, and this is able to fail over to, to another one. And if you are very lucky, you might have even read replicas. But for most of the time, uh, one, one single node is uh, the setup that we are dealing with. And in, in a NoSQL world, um, vertical and horizontal scalability are uh, the most natural pattern to apply for, for scalability. If a single machine does not, uh, is not sufficient, you just add another one um, until you have met your scalability requirements. So there we hit uh, some, some scalability bounds. With the reactive um, programming approach, we try to get rid of resource synchronization. And this means, in particular, that we go away from this threat per request model and from the blocking model, but rather try to write data in a non-blocking fashion to, to the I.O. We communicate um, through, through uh, NIO sockets. And what, what we do there is um, we want to avoid bottlenecks. And the most natural thing with relational databases is that they are implemented with an asset trans um, transaction model. And asset brings us not only atomicity, but also isolation. And by going reactive, we typically don't have this isolation notion, but uh, rather no single stores have their own atomic transaction uh, which is a single document transaction or single operation transaction. With relational databases, we want to group multiple statements within a single transaction, and this implies locking. So what we are basically doing is we are shifting this resource contention from the application back to the database, and this does not really play well with the idea we have uh, about reactive. So that gives you also an impression why relational databases aren't the best fit. But, however, we 
uh, although we, uh, we know there are certain limitations, we still want to go reactive with, with SQL. And which options do we have there today? Well, we have RxJava 2 JDBC, which is basically a wrapper around JDBC. And it does basically nothing else than providing you a nice API wrapping JDBC underneath with the option to offload work on a worker pool to a thread pool. By, by doing so, you get some sort of access for your relational database, but you do not really solve the problem of blocking. You can get, again, into resource contention. Um, once threads are blocked, the uh, work to do is written into a queue. And if you use a bounded blocking queue, uh, once the queue is full, then you have, again, a blocking model, which isn't the ideal uh, thing to do. There is an effort named ADVA, driven by Oracle. Uh, since Oracle also recognized there is a need to um, provide some non-blocking means to access relational databases, they started the asynchronous database API, which is based on completable futures. It's entirely driven by Oracle, and it's, uh, um, uh, there is a collaboration um, between the expert, uh, JDBC expert group and the ADBA folks. However, there is no single real driver implementation until now. That's more of an uh, API experiment until now. The API isn't stable yet, and it's not, not uh, shipped with JDK 11, so we can expect it uh, at the earliest with JDK 12. Um, but there are no real concrete plans uh, about a release date. But there, are, there is an uh, implementation available, which is uh, called AOJ, ADBA over JDBC. So you can plug in a JDBC driver into that and use it in an um, asynchronous fashion by offloading, again, work to the thread pool. Another thing uh, about ADBA is it guarantees you only asynchronicity and a non-blocking behavior. But when we are looking on what reactive streams gives us, the notion of back pressure, of demanding data and, and streaming data, um, then we will see that these kind of features are kind of missing in, within ADBA. And that's why we, as Pivotal, started efforts on R2DBC. As you might have learned today in the keynote, R2DBC, Reactive Relational Database, is, uh, API is an API experiment until now. And we built a um, proof of concept to integrate within uh, the Postgres database, as uh, Postgres is pretty much good documented. So this gave us the opportunity to integrate uh, with, with Postgres. We have also a Spring Data integration available, uh, which, is, um, which will be part of a great Spring Data relational module, um, so that you can use all the known features like repository support, a template API-like support, uh, with uh, in, uh, with uh, in from R2DBC. And to give you an idea how this could look like is that you have a connection factory, you have a database client that you are going to create. You then instantiate the, 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 that client and execute one or multiple statements within a transaction, so uh, such as transaction closure. And uh, the functional reactive nature of uh, the reactive programming gives us the possibility to provide a nice, concise API so that you can um, add in a function that uh, executes um, reactive code. Um, you can then group multiple statements with, within that. And once you are, you are done with your work, then you return the, the mono or flux, and everything within that closure is executed within a single transaction. So that's, that's an experiment that we, we started. It's available, available on GitHub. And if you want to play with it, these are the coordinates. So you find it currently within the Spring Data JDBC repository at the R2DBC branch. And we are more than happy if we would receive any feedback from you if you want to play with that. Stating the obvious, don't use it in production yet. <laughs> Next. Let's take a look how, how, the, how, how database 
exosemantics change from a synchronous to a reactive fetching model. So to visualize that, we have a gray line which, um, which denotes the transport uh, channel, the transport layer. And in a synchronous data access uh, model, you have an access to the data store. While the data access to the data store is ongoing, you spend CPU cycles, you burn CPU cycles, and wait until you get an answer from, from the data store so that the application can then continue with uh, the data that it has received from the database. And this is an ongoing thing. So uh, you do access to the database, you get responses back, and so on and so forth. And this time, between, between these SIMPL requests, you are blocking a thread. And that's what reactive data access is trying to address here, that we use the resources that we have available in a more efficient way so that we are no longer burning CPU cycles, but rather use, doing useful work within that time. Looking at, at a reactive data, a data access scheme, um, we again start with, uh, with access to, to the data store, but within that bank time, any other useful work can, can be done. So you could pr uh, start process, processing the next request, um, processing, process incoming data, and as soon as the very first item is received by the driver and is it handed, it's handed over to your application, then your application can basically start immediately with the processing. And as data streams in, the application processing um, continues to process the data and so on and so on. And once you reach the potential end of the cursor or the potential end of a buffer, the driver is going then back to the database, asking for more data. That's some sort of smart prefetching. This helps to reduce the time lag between uh, you're ready and done with processing and the next uh, fetching of the next chunk. And by doing so, you reduce the amount of time which is necessary between the individual individual processing steps. And in the end, everybody's happy, I guess so. But what are the concrete differences between imperative and uh, reactive data access? Well, drivers are required to provide some sort of callback mechanism and some executor that is doing all these callbacks. Typically, if you write to an NIO, non-blocking socket, uh, you are writing in a non-blocking fashion. And to read the data, you need some, some, uh, some worker that is reading from, from the data, uh, from, from the socket. So typically, this is implemented by providing a threading infrastructure, uh, usually an event loop if you are using Natty, or um, a thread pool or worker pool of threads if you are using plain NIO. With this, you will also experience a very different um, timeout handling. While we had in synchronous uh, drivers something like a socket timeout, SO timeout, which helps us to prevent um, timeouts on reads and writes, we no longer have this natural source of protection for reactive drivers or even asynchronous drivers. This is because you need in such scenarios and constellations, an active component which tracks the actual operation timeout. So while you had um, socket I input stream dot read, which would then start to block if no data is available, uh, in a non-blocking environment, you simply call read and no data com comes in. So this brings us from chunk operation timeout, uh, chunk, uh, chunk timeouts to operation timeouts. So you have to rethink how your timeouts are starting to, to work. Uh, while well, you had this um, notion of timeouting on read, on socket reads in a synchronous model, you have to switch to a different model in a reactive world because timeouts are there applied on a more higher granularity like operation timeouts. So the, uh, that you can then say, OK, this particular command has a, has a timeout, and no longer the socket read has a, has a timeout. So that's a, that's a difference in, in thinking. Um, and this helps us to narrow down the real timeout 
uh, to, of which a, a particular operation is able to, to take and no longer the infrastructure uh, uh, reads are, are guarded. So let's take a look on NoSQL drivers. So a driver, a reactive driver, is end-to-end non-blocking. And this means that write operations and read operations do not no longer block the caller. Um, while this was true for, um, for read operations, uh, for write operations, um, there's, there's a difference also in, uh, in, in read operations. As, as, as I mentioned, um, non-blocking reads do not block. So they also do not block the event loop. They feature an asynchronous request processing model so that you hand in a request and that uh, the request is either written in the originating thread you're currently onto or even the request is handed off to some event loop that then does the write. With this associated, you generate some sort of overhead because you go into thread switching so um, the payload you are going to write is no longer written by the actual thread, but rather by some, some different thread. And this uh, comes with cache invalidation on uh, very low level uh, JVM internals. So this will also explain that reactive drivers will have a slightly higher overhead than typical synchronous drivers. So said it differently, you do re reactive for scalability and resilience, but not really for performance on or throughput reasons. You can do if you have streaming scenarios, but if you have a lot of small individual requests, like with Redis, um, then you are maybe better off with using a traditional synchronous driver if you don't have to use reactive. Reactive drivers also require non-blocking pooling and non-blocking connection methods which are more of the internal side of things. And this also explains why you can't simply take some existing driver, like for JDBC, and uh, turn in, put it on, on, on an, um, hide, in, hide all the operations on an executor service, but rather the driver has to be full end-to-end non-blocking. And a typical driver does multiple things if you start a request. So when a request is coming in, you typically select a server, like with MongoDB, selecting the appropriate server to, to read from. Um, you queue the request and write, write the request out once your infrastructure is ready to do so. Once, uh, once the transport buffers are empty, all, all these goodies which are happen, happening really on the transport layer. Once the response comes back in, the response is starting to be decoded. Um, the response is potentially buffered. Um, reactive drivers are typically uh, demand aware, so back pressure aware, so they do not request more data than you requested within your application. So if you requested only 10 items, then the driver will also fetch only 10 items from, from a cursor. So that's how, how these drivers would trans translate requests. And then finally, once the request is complete, they send a completion signal and you are done with the particular request. How does it look like for, for the data stores and their drivers? Well, for MongoDB, we have a reactive driver, which is all built on top of the asynchronous driver. And this driver translates all the asynchronous functionality into a reactive streams driver-like uh, functionality, which comes with certain limitations. We'll see in a minute which, uh, which, what limitations these are. The nice thing here is that MongoDB binds its, the MongoDB driver binds its uh, cursor life cycle to the actual stream. So um, when, you, when you subscribe to a Flux, the stream, uh, the, the Flux is uh, returns you a subscription, and this subscription can be used to manage particular, in particular resources. So when the read is completed, the cursor is closed, or when you cancel the subscription and say, okay, uh, after 10 items, cancel the subscription, then also the cursor is released and, and killed, which is a very nice side effect of managing server-side resources. It has a pluggable I.O. By default, um, it's using Java NIO, 
but there's uh, also a netty integration, which is required if you want to use um, SSL, since um, implementing SSL isn't trivial, and netty has already an SSL implementation. That was um, a quite smart move to do. One other specialty here is um, that MongoDB does not do pipelining. So this means every single request is handled on, a, on a, its own connection, uh, which requires then connection pooling on the client side. And the connection is released back to the connection pool once a previous command is uh, completed. So this also means that uh, you are able to exhaust the, um, the file handles on, on your local system if you open sufficiently enough commands um, unless you add protection parameters to, to your driver, like um, limiting the number of requests and these kind of things. You should always uh, keep in mind, we are no longer blocking and waiting. So this request model from like Tomcat, where we had a bounded number of uh, threads, like 200 or 100, uh, which would protect us from these kind of, uh, kind of resource exhaustion is no longer given. But we are directly accepting a request, opening a new connection, and this can easily lead to, uh, to exhaustion of your resources. How does it look like on, an, on the fetching model side? So if we have a query, we issue a request. The request is written out to the transport. And MongoDB re, uh, starts replying within chunks. Because of the asynchronous nature of the driver, which is await, awaiting uh, on completion of, of um, the, whole, the whole request, uh, we are required to wait until the whole response streams in. So the granularity on which the asynchronous driver is working is a future, and uh, in particular, a future of list of documents. So that's, that's how, how this translates. When the complete response has streamed in, um, then the driver starts immediately to prefetch the next chunk when there is sufficient demand for that. So if, if the driver sees um, that only 10 items have uh, come back uh, have came and came back, and you requested 11 or 12 or 13, then the driver goes back to the server and issues a request for getting new data. And as soon as this request is written to the transport, the driver hands you back the result which was previously received. And this is to do some sort of smart prefetching, so asking the server for more data if there is demand for that, and then start emitting the items to the actual apl application, which is a very smart, uh, smart move. Uh, to say. Looking at how the driver works internally with the demand, um, we will see that the uh, subscription demand, which is requested by, by any consumer or any operator, is translated into uh, what MongoDB calls batch size. So if you request long max, which, is, which correlates basically to a subscribe command uh, without bounding the, the demand, then MongoDB will request, by, and the driver will request by default all the data which is available. This is also very smart because if you have requested less than that, say 10 or 20, then this will translate automatically into the batch size and request smaller chunks of, of data. But this has a caveat. This looks nice, nice this picture, but what if when we add something like a filter operator in between? A filter operator works the way if it sees an item which does not match the filter um, condition, the filter predicate, then drops the item and requests one. And what this really means is that when you exhaust the buffer and go the next time to, to the MongoDB, then you request one item from MongoDB. And if this does, does not match, you can go again back to MongoDB and request another one, which ends up in a lot of requests. And let's, let's just take a, take a look what this looks like in a demo. Here we go. So 
let's, let's do a simple request. And uh, what I'm using here is Mongo operations from, from Spring Data, uh, querying the person collection. Um, I'm uh, demanding, I'm, I'm registering demand for 10, 10 items, waiting until these 10 items stream in, and then request, uh, request another 10. I have uh, registered a, a logger component, which logs me the um, actual Mongo commands. So we will see here a find operation that translates uh, to the person collection with a batch size of 10. So far, so good. Then, once these 10 items are, uh, are processed, we issue a get more command, again, with a batch size of 10. Everything is cool so far. Now, when we add a filter condition, a client set filter condition, uh, and we do basically the same, then we will see a slightly different behavior and if we run, run that without additional instrumentation, we see a way more, get more commands, which then translate also to batch size 10. But since we, um, we are dropping some items, uh, we are doing a lot of round trips to request more data from, from the database um, and do more round trips than it would be extremely necessary. And that's one of the caveats that you can fall into because that's not nothing which is really obvious from, from a user side. You just see it, I think, in production when things start to become, become slow. There is a possibility to work around that and there are apparently two possibilities. One is on the project reactor side and the other one is on the spring and driver side. So project reactor has a smart prefetching algorithm where you can say, okay, uh, let's control the rate at which items are uh, requested from, from a data source with the limit rate operator. If I take the limit rate operator with 20, which denotes the maximum number of uh, items requested, then we see, okay, we have a way uh, smaller amount of round trips to our server, uh, and the batch size is always around 20. That's one thing that you can use, and this is transparently applied to, to the driver. The other option, which is rather new, which was also released uh, with the release uh, from um, Friday with the Loveless GA release, is the possibility to set the cursor batch size. That's a new option on, a, on the Fury class, which helps us to indicate to the driver a manual override. We are no longer driven by the real demand, but rather, we know in this particular use case, 20 is the best batch size that we can, can use, and this makes the most sense. And running this uh, together with a filter operator and without limit rate will give us the very same result. So that's something you should really watch out if you are using MongoDB and you are using operators that could affect the multiplicity of uh, requesting uh, items. Spring Data ships with specific support for, um, for features that make sense to implement in a reactive way in a very natural approach because we do not need uh, to set up additional uh, threading infrastructure or provide um, messaging listener containers, which are tailable cursors and chain streams. And with MongoDB, for, if you have been in the previous session, you have also seen that there is a trans transaction support for the reactive MongoDB. Uh, part. And as I mentioned, pay attention to your cursor size if you run into issues. The next driver on our list is the lattice driver for uh, Redis. It's a fully reactive driver, and we will see in a minute what this and, uh, really, uh, really uh, means. It's built on top of um, Netty uh, together with Project Reactor. We are able to use singleton connections and pooled connections. And singleton connections with Redis make them really the most sense since Redis is single-threaded. So adding additional connections for the sake of performance does not really make, make any sense here. Um, that's different with uh, things like Cassandra or MongoDB. So let's take a look on the fetching model, how, uh, how the lattice driver works. <coughs> 
So you issue a, a command, a request is written to, to the transport, and as soon as the first chunk of data streams in, the command uh, is uh, going to be a process uh, chunk by chunk and element by element. So we have true stream decoding here, and we are not obliged to wait until the last element streams in. While we had this limitation with the async driver of MongoDB that we have to await the very last chunk that uh, comes in, uh, we can uh, read the first element that streams in with Redis and start with uh, data processing uh, as soon as the data is available. And this helps us to, again, reduce latency and help us to, to reduce the time between uh, the request and time to the first response processing. Once the command is complete, you get basically the end of, of the data, and there you go. Specifics here are um, the um, reactive uh, implementation uses byte buffers for uh, byte buffer pooling to help to reduce uh, GC pressure. A speciality of uh, what Redis is doing is uh, there are so-called nil answer, uh, responses or null answers. Um, since null is prohibited in reactive streams, um, what the driver then has to do is instead of returning null, it uh, just suppresses the, uh, the response. For, uh, that may, makes sense for data structures like, like mono, where you can have one or zero responses. And for, uh, for fluxes, there are specific data structures which encapsulate the absence of values. Another thing which is unique to, to this uh, driver is if there is no demand for data, so say you have written a request to, to the transport um, that you uh, request a, a number of keys or, or data elements, and in the application side, there is currently no demand to process the data because components are busy, the driver stops reading. So it leaves the data where it is, outside of the JVM, and you no longer have to allocate or pre-allocate even uh, data chunks to, um, for, for data that you are currently not using um, to, to process. Once there is, again, demand, the driver resumes reading. Apache Cassandra. So, uh, Apache Cassandra ships um, with uh, an asynchronous driver out of the box, which is built on top of Netty. And the data stacks driver, which is used in Spring Data Cassandra, um, is capable of synchronous and asynchronous command execution. Here we have, again, something which is uh, asynchronous but not reactive. But this, uh, again, gives us the opportunity to, uh, to build a reactive facade, a reactive adapter on top of this driver. Um, Cassandra is uh, multi-threaded and has multiple uh, cluster nodes, which uh, gives us the opportunity to use boot connections again uh, and to multiplex uh, commands across multiple connections multi and multiple hosts. The query scheme is similar to what we have seen in MongoDB. We are writing a query that translates to, to a network request. Uh, response chunks are going to stream in, uh, have to be collected and picked up until the complete response uh, has arrived. And then we are able to start with the result processing, uh, which is, again, the limitation of an asynchronous driver. Cassandra also features paging. So if there is demand to um, do scrolling and uh, reading from, from a cursor to obtain multiple pages, then the driver is doing that for you transparently. So then you have a flux of person objects, and the paging for, uh, is handled for you in a transparent fashion, so then, uh, that you don't have to deal with it unless you really have to. There is another generation of the Cassandra driver in the works. And beginning with this uh, 4.0 generation, there were a lot of discussions how to improve on ex particular execution models. And the reactive execution model seemed quite appealing to the driver team, so we picked up efforts on, on that end. But for some reasons, the reactive support was dropped out of uh, the, scope, or the actual project scope. The driver is still in better state, so we don't, do not expect um, the driver to be part of the next release train of Spring Data. And I think 
personally, the re release will happen somewhere next year. So this will be still an asynchronous driver, so we have to stick to, to this fetching scheme unless you start voting for the tickets down there in the URL to convince the driver maintainers that uh, reactive data access is a good idea. Uh, however, um, that's an outlook for, for the driver, and we are not quite sure where this journey is uh, going to, to take us with Apache Cassandra. The last driver in lineup line is Couchbase. And Couchbase has, again, a fully reactive driver, which is based on Netty and Rx Java 1. So Rx Java 1 has no or very little, a very little notion of back pressure, but still this enables us to stream the data back again into the, into the client and the application, which has a huge value to reduce latency. Couchbase is using very different connection schemes because it has this duality of being a document store and a key value store at the same time with a full text engine on top. And depending on the particular operation, you will experience different behaviors and different fetching models for Cassandra. Examples of that are if you go for key value or the dynamic configuration protocol, you have a request response scheme, and then you start emitting results. If you search for data with a full text engine, um, you, you do a nickel query, this um, um, Couchbase specific uh, query language, or if you query a particular view, you get response streaming. So you get uh, all the benefits from a fully reactive model uh, that is able to stream data back again into your application. And we've seen that already with Redis, you write a, resp a request on the transport, um, the first chunk of data streams in, in the, in the streaming model, and you are able to consume that data as soon as it arrives within your application. Maybe some of you have followed the, the, the movement within our Eric's Java, and um, what, what has to be also said is that Rx Java 1 is no longer maintained. Its successor, Rx Java 2, has a very broad adoption, so the folks at Couchbase have to decide where this journey will go. Be before, I think, a couple of months ago, uh, we didn't really know where this journey is going to, to bring us, but Michael Nitschinger, uh, one of the uh, leads of the uh, JVM SDK, started a poll on Twitter. I think it's non-representative, uh, or at least not really democratic, but you can see some, some trend uh, where he was asking, uh, hey, users, please give us a vote or an indication what you would like to see the next uh, driver generation to be built on, either Rx Java 2 or Project Reactor, and we see a slight trend towards Project Reactor. And what really will happen, well, the future has to, to show us. Sometimes we have a scenario where we have imperative and reactive bits. And this is a scenario where things are starting to get brittle. But let's take, take a first look on, on the blocking and imperative side of things. So when you're an imperative programmer, that's, uh, I guess, uh, the majority of programming models today, um, then blocking is a fine thing. And if you block in an imperative uh, program execution, that's good, because that's how things are supposed to work, and everybody is happy. If we t try to do that within reactive programming, then we will see that either this has a negative impact on our performance, or this has an even an impact, negative impact on the application at all. So one message, one key takeaway from, from this session you should take is do not block in reactive applications. Neither use blocking APIs nor block for and await the execution of uh, reactive uh, bits. In particular, this means if you have things like, like an application initializer or you use spring events, um, then the things are all that end on dot .block are something you should really avoid. Um, 
you, if you have the opportunity of having various APIs on, on the class path, like saying the synchronous API and the reactive API, I urge you, I really urge you to use the synchronous one and not to use the reactive one. We'll see in a minute why, why this really is. And this, uh, this use of imperative bits where you are imperative is really a good pattern to, to follow. So in this example, we had uh, the reactive Mongo operations in the previous slide. Now we are using uh, Mongo operations, the synchronous one, um, on, on this slide. And everything is at least better. It's better to block the thread with the imperative API than blocking the thread with a reactive API. The reason, is, therefore, is the underlying execution model. So I'm um, not sure how many of you are familiar with, with Netty and uh, execution models. The most drivers are really built on top of Netty. And Netty uses an event loop to uh, execute its task. An event loop is basically a single thread, which has a uh, worker queue. And as soon as uh, there is an item coming into the, the queue, the event loop, the particular thread, starts to, to do the work. And this looks like this. So we have the work queue on, on the left side. We have the event loop in the middle. And as soon as work comes into the queue, the, event, the single thread starts to work on, on, on this item. In particular, this means it's some sort of callback, some, maybe something like a runnable or a callable, that is then invoked. So the thread calls the runnable.run method. Within this callback, some work is going to happen. That's the actual code which is going to be executed that you will probably find within your application, within your framework, within all of the bits um, that are between your endpoint and your, your driver. And this may be uh, database access, some computation, some file access, I.O. things, and so on. And what you typically do in such scenarios, you um, talk to the asynchronous APIs of that particular resource that you are trying to address. So for a database, you would use uh, some uh, reactive or asynchronous database driver. For a file, uh, there's an asynchronous file channel, and so on and so forth. You do the work. You issue a query. And what this query is, uh, is doing, it's registering another callback. So uh, it's not awaiting the result to, to come in, but rather you get a promise. And as soon as the result comes back, the result handle or this result work, of I work item is going to be executed. So it then ends up again in the worker queue. So that's basically how the event loop mechanism is working. Now. Once the, all this work is done, the uh, work is released, and the thread is released back again. So it is able to process then, then the next item. So in, in this example, this work item just disappears from, from our, our queue, and we continue with processing the, the next callback item. Let's take a look what happens if we start blocking. Well, we have, again, um, some, some item of work in the event loop queue. We have uh, the single, uh, single thread which is starting to work on. And we issue a request to some asynchronous channel. And the important bit is that is, it is an asynchronous channel and that the work uh, which results from the, from the request is going to be handled on the very same thread. But since we are using some really opaque infrastructure, we can, do not really care from the application side uh, what's really happening below the, the, the application layer until we really fiddle into that. And to be honest, that's nothing we want to do on a regular basis. So typically, we just issue a request, and then somebody will take care of that. If the request is um, registering a callback, which would then uh, start processing the, the response, uh, and we would wait for the completion, then what we are essentially doing is we are preventing this particular thread 
from progressing in its work. So when we wait for completion of, of that, that particular work item, which did not complete yet, because the completion callback isn't addressed yet, we are blocking the thread, and our whole application gets defunct with something like a deadlock, but it's not a true deadlock, but we are um, basically preventing the event loop from doing its work. And that's why blocking within reactive applications and blocking of on uh, asynchronous resources is so dangerous. With a very single call of dot block, we can um, basically prevent our whole application from working. And that's why I urge you to not call dot block anywhere when you are on a reactive stack. So in the end, do not block the event loop. So that's my message for you. I think we are quite on time. I hope you had a gorgeous spring one day two. Um, if you have any questions, I will be here around. Thanks for attending this talk and have a great spring one.